Hello. It's great to be with you. Glad you're watching. This week is going to be some really new things and some old things from last week. Uh, I promised you that we would go over things on several occasions because it's such a complex story. But I want to start out with a sandwich, another sandwich from the book of Mark. This is Mark's last sandwich before he closes the story. And um, what we're going to do is look at this sandwich and then in another week, next week, we're going to compare sandwiches, uh, the ones in Mark and the one about Melchizedek. Now, we saw the Melchizedek sandwich several weeks ago, but I want us to get practice on how to see these sandwiches so that when you see, do see them, you'll say, ah, that's a sandwich. And it, it's interesting that even scholars call them sandwiches. Uh, no technical jargon with this one, just plain old sandwich. Well, let's look at Mark's final sandwich in Mark 15 on your paper. Uh, in your Bible, it'll be Mark 15, 40 to 16a. So, um, I'm going to uh, read it as a sandwich, and then we're going to um, look at it more closely. And as we're reading it, I want you to circle anything with seeing and the word look or looking. Okay, so let's go through it. We have our first slice of bread. Now, you know that a sandwich is made up of two slices of bread and lunch meat in between. Well, a sandwich in the book of Mark and the Melchizedek sandwich does the same thing in a way. Uh, we have the first slice of bread. That would be um, that that would be uh, the a story that begins. But then the story is interrupted. And that we interruption we call the lunch meat. That's the most important part of the sandwich, of course, although I do like bread. Um, so we have the lunch meat. That's an interruption by another story. When that story is completed, the first story that we looked at, that is continued now, which makes the second or end slice of bread and it is completed. So a story begins, first slice of bread. The story is interrupted by another, uh, by uh, the lunch meat, uh, by another story. That story is complete. And the first story that was interrupted now gets completed. That's the second slice of bread. Got that pictured in your mind? Okay, so let's look at the first slice of bread read in our text. In verse 40, it tells us this. There were also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Less and Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and serve him. And there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Okay. That's the first slice of bread. Then there's an interruption. In 1542 to 47, it says this, when evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate, and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, and summoning the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph brought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb, 
which had been hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, uh, Joseph is uh, short for Joseph, were looking on where he was. So we saw the first slice of bread. That was the women looking from a distance at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The interruption is a man, uh, and that is Joseph of Arimathea. And then we wind up with the women again in the second slice of bread that finishes up the first story. This is in 16, 1 to 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking on, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right who was clothed in a white robe, and they were distressed. And he said to them, Do not be distressed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He's not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee, where you will see him, just as he told you. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and terror had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That is the end of our story. So let's take a look at it more closely, shall we? In a sandwich, normally, there are words that uh, uh, are in each section that connect the whole uh, story. So these repeated words will be throughout the story. That's the normal way, although there are others that don't do that. Um, we have connecting words between this story and the middle story and the end story. Did anyone see that? Why don't you go through and look carefully? And I'll give you a chance to do that so you can pause and then we'll be back. Okay? Okay. Well... Here's the women looking on in the first section. At the end of the second section, those women are mentioned again, only two of them rather than the three. Maybe Salome went home to make her husband dinner. Uh, anyway, they, uh, they're looking on again. And in the last section, the women again are looking on and they see something. So that holds the whole sandwiched together. It's like a toothpick put in the sandwich to hold it together. Uh, of course, the women's names are in each section. There's Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less and Joseph, and Salome. And uh, two of them are mentioned a second time, and three, the first three, are mentioned the third time in the second slice of bread. So they're all there. There are other words that also hold the second or middle section together with the third section. Did you notice them? There's in verse 46, uh, he, Joseph laid him in a tomb and then Mary and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were looking on where he was laid. We have that same uh, two words, uh, laid him, it, down the bottom in the second slice of bread, verse 7. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see, oops, verse 6, sorry. 
And he said to them, Do not be distressed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. Um, and you saw the word Saul, didn't you? Several times in this last section. So looking and seeing play a part in this story, don't they? Well, if you look at this, we have the woman at the beginning. At the end of section two, they're mentioned again, but almost like a sidebar, just to connect the three sections. Because the main person, character in the middle, is Joseph of Arimathea. This is one of the only times in Mark, I think it is the only time in Mark, where a man is highlighted. Because remember, the sandwich is always about the lunch meat, cheese, and lettuce and tomato that's in the middle. And this one also is highlighting, but this time it's a man. Nor uh, very often the sandwiches are uh, have a woman in the center. In fact, you'll see that on next week's um, sandwich. So Joseph is being contrasted with the women because that's what sandwiches do. They make a contrast, a contrast between the lunch meat and the slices of bread. So Joseph is being contrasted. First, he's being contrasted with faithful, unfaithful disciples. Who should have been there to take care of the body from the cross? The disciples. Who is there? Joseph of Arimathea. Who's Joseph? Well, it tells us he was a, a, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. And it was the Sanhedrin that put Jesus to death. Had Jesus put to death. And yet, here he is. What happened? Somewhere along the line, Joseph began to listen to Jesus. Perhaps even at the trial he was supposed to be at with the other members of the Sanhedrin. We don't know, but here he is. And look what he's doing. He's gathering his courage. In other words, he, like the women, is fearful. But whereas the women, well, if you look at the women, uh, they look on from a distance. Now, who else uh, was at a distance from Jesus? Well, if you remember, Peter was walking behind Jesus, who was just arrested, but he's walking at a distance. So these women are being compared to whom? And to Peter who was at a distance. Then at the bottom, they flee. Who else in our story before this fled? Well, the other disciples, didn't they? Soon as Jesus was arrested, they fled and were never seen again until after the resurrection, right? Well, they're being compared to those disciples, aren't they, again? But Joseph is also being compared to the disciples as well as the women. But he musters up courage and goes to a place where he might be put to death as a follower of Jesus by Pilate. So there's Joseph. Now, we have all these characters who are named the three women, in fact, two of the women are named three times, aren't they? And then Joseph, who's mentioned. Now, why are their names mentioned? Can anybody guess why they might be mentioned? Well, the three women are mentioned because every part of Jesus's passion here 
from the crucifixion through the burial to the resurrection, they are our witnesses. Yeah, they're important. Now, before this, in the book of Mark, women are not mentioned. Uh, there's Peter's mother. There's the woman with, who uh, anoints Jesus. But nobody is named. It is here at the climax of the story that the names are given. And why? So that people who want to see if Mark was telling the truth can go to these women because they're still alive when Mark writes this book, we assume. Now, notice something, because the, the name Mary is a common name. So therefore, uh, some more information is given about them, isn't it? Mary of Magdalene, she is from, Mary Magdalene is from Magdala. And then uh, Mary, the second Mary, see, Mary's a common, the most common name in Israel at that time. Uh, she's uh, identified with her two sons, James the Less and Joseph. And then in the middle, she's identified with just Joseph. And then at the end, the second slice of bread, she's the mother of James. So uh, he's being a little creative, I guess, uh, with uh, his identification. Salome may not be as common a name, and therefore she's not given any other designation. But perhaps she may be the only Christian Jewish woman who was there at the tomb, and all at the crucifixion, the tomb, and at the resurrection, right? Okay, so um, we have reasons for this story and reasons for the giving of names. Now, it is the women who are there at all three places. You don't see Joseph at the crucifixion. Everybody has fled. And Joseph is probably not there either, or he would have been mentioned. Uh, he's only mentioned when he goes to Pilate. He's also mentioned in the book of John. And he's mentioned there along with Nicodemus, who also helps him. But that's not the point of this story to tell us both names. It's just us. It's Joseph of Arimathea, who's important to Mark. So um, we have this sandwich that's contrasting Joseph of Arimathea with the disciples who aren't there at all and with the women who are there, but they flee just as the disciples flee. Now, we know historically that they do what the angel tells them to do, and that is to go to the disciples. But for this narrative, Mark wants to end right here, uh, end this um, sandwich right here. Why? Um, I think that there are several reasons, but one is uh, that these women, their first reaction is fear and to flee. Now, later they will do what the angel told them, but at the beginning, Mark points out, and probably from the record of the women, that at first they fled in fear and didn't go anywhere. It wasn't until later that they go and give the information. Uh, but Mark wants us to see that uh, uh, this because he's writing to a church that's being persecuted. And that there will be people who will flee in the persecution and may even deny Christ as, as Peter did. But there is hope for both Peter and the women and future believers who become so paranoid with fear that they may run and then come back to the Lord. So um, I think this one gives hope. Why? 
Because look what the angel says to the, to the men, uh, to the women. And uh, the angel in verse 6 says, Do not be distressed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, uh, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples. Look what it adds. Look who it points out. And Peter. Now, why would they say, and Peter, he's one of the disciples, right? He denied Jesus. And why would he need that special word from the angel who's only giving them what God tells them to do? Because Peter may be so embarrassed ashamed that he may not even come to the tomb feeling like he had failed but they call his name out so that he knows he got a special invitation isn't that beautiful he got a special invitation so There may be another reason also. These women flee. Do they have hope? They certainly do. Because P Peter, who fled, and the other disciples who fled, were given a special mercy. So are they. So we don't, we're ending with a note of hope. We really are. Because in that last piece of bread, people are forgiven. Okay, so uh, let me also give you one last bit of information. I think Mark's question to us is, will you flee also when the time of testing comes? He doesn't want us to. He wants us to be courageous, have courage like Joseph. Okay, so last week we went through Genesis 13 first to give the backdrop of Genesis 14. Because in 13 we, give, we are told the reason why Lot is not there with Abram, why Lot is in Sodom. And we need to know that in order to re realize why Abram needs to get in himself into that battle. At, at least at the very end of the battle, when the uh, four kings take off after having defeated the five kings and six other cities. Um so that I gave you the backdrop in chapter 13. Remember how it began and ended with um, an inclusio? Uh, Nate, now, Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and gold, and he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. Between Bethel and Ai to the place where he had made an altar at first. And here Abram called on the name of Yahweh. The same things are said at the very end. And it says in verse 18, so Abram moved his tent. Um, and then um, remember, uh, his tent is mentioned and moving is mentioned or at least journeying. And came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to Yahweh, just as he did at the beginning. So this inclusio holds together the story that's in the middle. And it, it um, let's read that story in the middle. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For their possessions were so great 
that they could not dwell together. We're told that twice, aren't we? And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Then Abram, Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, remember left hand is north, because you're in this setting in the Bible, uh, east is where you look. So left of east, when you're looking at the east, left of east is north. And then it says, then I will go to the right or the right hand. That's what, uh, how our Bibles say it. Uh, they don't say uh, north and south. Uh, they say uh, left hand and right hand. But left hand means north. Right hand is the same word as south. So left hand can be translated north. Right hand can be translated south. And it's better for us if we hear north and south because it's going to be jarring in a little bit when we find out what Lot's choice is. So then I will go to the right, south. Or if you take the right hand, south, then I will go to the left, north. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of Yahweh, like the land of Egypt, in the direction of Zoar. This was before Yahweh destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed where? He didn't journey to the north or the south. That was what was offered by Abram because that was the land that God had given to him. He journeyed out of, outside the land to the east. That was not a good thing because we know that east is the wrong direction for Lot to be going. Yahweh said to Abram, uh, wait a second, hmm, there it is. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against Yahweh. That's the second thing told us about Sodom, isn't it? Uh, first we're told uh, that Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be destroyed. Now we're told how wicked Sodom is. Yahweh said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the land, so that if one can count the dust of the land, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So, and then that's the middle part, okay? So now that we've read it, what I'm going to do is ask you questions. I'm going to wait at the end of the question to see, <laughs> to give you time to answer it. I'll give you about three to five seconds. Now, if you need more time, just put it on pause after each question, okay? But then I'm going to answer it so that you can see if your answer is the same as mine. So question one. Okay, how do the words land and valley help us to contrast Abe, Abram, and Lot? Okay, if we look in verse 11 to 12, it'll say this. Lot chose for himself the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. 
Abram settled in the land of Canaan. Now, the land of Canaan was the promised land. And that word land is extremely important because that's one of the promises God gave to Abram and his Abram's descendants, land. But what does Lot do? He chooses the valley, not the land. Okay, so that contrasts them. Two, Abram and Lot both lift up their eyes. How is this a contrast? Okay, well, look at verse 10, and it says this, And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the Garden of Yahweh, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. Okay, so Lot lifts up his eyes, and he sees what is good to him. But in verse... Um, Verse 14, we have Abram, and it says this, Yahweh said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and your seed forever. Okay, when Abram lifted up his eyes, he was being commanded to do so by the Lord God who was giving him the good. In God's eyes, Lot chose the good in his own eyes, doesn't he? Let's do uh, question three. How does our translation north and south rather than left and right affect our understanding of Abram's offer to Lot and Lot's response to the offer. Well, remember uh, that Abram was offering the land that God gave to him. He is being magnanimous. And he's being magnanimous because Abram has in his mind, that he's an old man, that he needs descendants, and he has no descendants. But he does have his nephew, his brother's son. And in his mind, he is giving Lot any part of the land that he wants that he may someday inherit from his uncle Abram. And so Abram is being magnanimous. Lot is going to turn up his nose at the offer. And because of that, he travels east and he loses the inheritance. So far, what does east mean in Genesis? Well, it means you're going in the wrong direction. Adam and Eve. Cain, uh, the people of Babel, all go east, and now Lot does. Not a good place to go. I didn't give you any room to answer that, did I? So I'm, I'm going to be better. I'll be better. So let's, uh, question four. How does Lot's choice affect Abram's choice of an heir? Well, Lot loses the inheritance. Now, if you go, I don't have my Bible right here, but you need to go to uh, chapter 15, in the chapter immediately after the chap uh, chapter 14, um, and the story of Melchizedek. So in chapter 15, Lot moves uh, 14, you know, Lot moves and um, uh, in chapter uh, East, and in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, Abram doesn't even mention Lot as his heir, does he? 
I have no heir, no one to inherit my stuff, except Eliezer of Damascus, who's my servant. In those days, if you had a lot of property and money and had no son, sometimes you chose um, one of your servants who has been faithful to be your heir. And and um, and so he he's no longer um, considering Lot to be his heir, is he? No, nope, he's not. Okay, so um, let's look at question five. How do uh, verses twelve and eighteen show that the author wants us to continue the contrast between Abraham and Lot? even though 18 is the last verse. Well, let's look at verse 12. Verse 12 tells us this. Um, Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. In 18, Abram moves his tent and came and settled just like Lot settled in verse 12, only he settles in Canaan. He settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron, and there he built an altar to Yahweh. Does Lot build an altar to Yahweh? No. Nope. No, he doesn't. Uh, question six. In verses... 10 to 11, we have words that we've heard before in Genesis. Let me tell you what words. Eyes, Saul, Garden of Yahweh, which is Garden of Eden. Moved east. What story is this? Yes, the Adam and Eve story. They, uh, the woman, uh, thought that the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was good to the eyes. She saw it, and she saw that it was good to the eyes. She and her husband ate of the fruit, the forbidden fruit, just as Lot is going to eat the forbidden fruit by moving east. Um, and there it is. He moves east. And Lot is choosing a land that looks like the Garden of Eden. But it ain't. And he's not supposed to go into the garden anyway because it's being uh, guarded by a cherubim. Okay, next question and last question. How have you been doing so far? If you haven't gotten them, it's okay. We only went over this story last week, and now you've gotten a good reminder, haven't you? This was a review, that's all. And I thought it would be fun to review with these questions and see if you could do it. Verse 6, how do the book ends? That's the beginning and the end. Show the contrast between Abram and Lot. Okay. Well, Abraham pictures the righteous man who worships God. Lot pictures Adam and Eve. And he's in the center. Abram is at the both ends. Okay? Good. Now we can go on to the Melchizedek, um, not the Melchizedek, uh, the Battle of the Kings. We'll later get to Melchizedek. But we're not going to get to Melchizedek today. Next week, we will get to Melchizedek. Okay? We want to go over the battle again. Do you remember the technique that is used by the author and um, to describe the battle? 
he uses a chiasm. You remember that? Let's just read it through and see the chiasm again. Now it was in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, <coughs> Hadarlaomer, cheddar cheese, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim. Uh, they prepared for battle against Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemabur, king of Zavoyim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these joined together in the valley of valley of Siddim, that is the Sea of Salt, or we call it the Dead Sea. Okay, let's just picture that. We have uh, the kings, four kings, from the eastern side of the um, Fertile Crescent. They come over the Fertile Crescent and come down into Canaan. They come down on the um, eastern side of the Jordan River. That's on the right. Okay. Um, they come down on the eastern side of the Jordan River and they, uh, they're going to battle the kings, uh, five kings that are on the southeast side of the Dead Sea. And the arrangement is this. It's the kings, the four kings from the Fertile Crescent that rise up against the five kings of Canaan. So we're seeing this battle from the point of view of the four kings from the Fertile Crescent because it says those kings prepared for battle against the kings of Canaan. And then something happens with the X. This is the middle part. And uh, it's kind of strange because it goes backwards in time, telling us how come this battle is going to be fought. And it's going to be fought because 14 years before, the kings from the Fertile Crescent had come and conquered over these five cities, taken away slaves, property, uh, clothing, everything they could get, silver, gold, and then exhorted tribute from them, from these five kings of Canaan, and demanded that that tribute be paid every year. And it was for 12 years. But then at the end of 12 years, um, the um, kings of the fertile, uh, sorry, of Canaan revolt. So they don't pay in the 13th year. And it takes a year for the kings of the Fertile Crescent to get their soldiers and come over the Fertile Crescent in the 14th year. And while they're coming, what they do is they come from Fertile Crescent, over the Fertile Crescent, and as they're coming down on the east side of the Jordan, they conquer over extra peoples. In fact, six extra people groups. Now we're being told this. Why are we being told this? Well, we're being told this so that we can see how formidable, how dangerous, how strong this army from the Fertile Crescent is. So strong that they're going to be able to defeat the five kings and the six other cities that they uh conquered before they get to battle against the five kings 
of Canaan. So this is a formidable group which prepares us for when Abram, through the help of God, Yahweh, it takes 300 men, 318, and some friends, and he follows the path up to where the four, four kings from the Fertile Crescent have traveled. They're going back to their cities with Lot and with uh, all kinds of people and all kinds of goods. Uh, they've really demolished um, the eastern side of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. And yet, Abram is able to defeat them and get back the people and the goods. Wow, is our God a great God? Because that's, Melchizedek says, it's because of your God that you were able to do this. So we're brought in to this story First, because Lot has dragged us into this story by moving to Sodom. But we are brought into this story in order to show how phenomenal our God is, that he is able to defeat. Just like in the story of Gideon with his 300 men, we're able to defeat the enemy. Our God is great. He can defeat any enemy. Any. So what do we have to fear? Nothing. Do we uh, get to fear uh, the corona, uh, corona virus? We don't have to. It's not that we won't get it. We might. But God goes with us. He is with us. And we never walk alone. And what's the worst case scenario? We go to be with him. Okay, so uh, let's let's look at that middle part now that I've explained it. For twelve years, they have been uh, subs um, the Canaanites kings have been subservient to Keterleomer, and in the thirteenth year, they had revolted. But then in the 14th year came Keterleomer, cheddar cheese, and the kings who were with him. So who's the leader of the pack uh, from uh, the Fertile Crescent? Keterleomer, um, who were with them. They struck the Raphaites. That's one group of people they strike before they get to the battle with the five kings of Canaan. Uh, Raphaites in Astaroth. Carnaim, the Zuzites in Ham, the Emites in Sheva, Keriatayim, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir near El Paran, which is by the wilderness. As they returned, they came to En Mishpat, or Judgment Spring, that is now Kadesh, and struck all the territory of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites, who were settled in Hatzon, uh, Tamar. So there's, if you, uh, let's count. You want to number it? Um, they struck, one, the Raphaites, two, the Zuzites, three, the Emites, four, the Horites, five, way down near the bottom, Amalekites, and six, the Amorites. They are a formidable group. Yes. So you can see that the background is given here in the middle. So this is not in chronological order, is it? This story is being told not in chronological order because the battle between the four kings of the Fertile Crescent and the five kings of um of uh, Canaan are are told at the beginning and at the end and what happened before that is told in the middle 
So what can we say? That's uh, called creative order. Now, uh, if, if we're to look at this, here's what we ought to do. The first thing that happens is at the X. So put a one, big one, in front of the material at X. Okay? Now, that means that what happens next is at the top, the first A, B, C, D, right? At the top. So put a two there. That's what happens next. And then D, C, B, A. Uh, this is told kind of backwards, isn't it? Doesn't seem to be the right order, at least not the right order as the first A, B, C, D. This is reversed. But it's also telling us the um, whose point of view it is again. This time, it's the point of view of the Canaanites. Then went out the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zavoyim, and the king of Bela, that is now Zoar. They set their ranks against them in war in the valley of Siddim against Kederleomer. Now, in the first ABCD, it was Kederleomer against these five kings. In the second set, it is the five kings against Kederleomer. Two groups coming against each other, both, both thinking they can win. So it says they set their ranks against them in war in the Valley of Siddim against Kedaleomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goyim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Alisar. Four kings against five. Okay. So we saw that number one went with the X. That's the first thing that happened. Then the next thing was our, our A, B, C, D at the top. That's number two. So therefore, what is D, C, B, A? What number is that? Well, if you said three, you're wrong. Because remember... It's the same battle as at the top, only from a different point of view. So what number should you put there in front of DCBA? Number two, <laughs> just like at the top, because they're both the same battle. So you can see that putting it in a chiasm sometimes uh, is not in chronological order. That's not all the time, but in this case, it is. So what happens in the X? That's the most important part. That is what leads us into the story and tells us why they should be considered the kings of the Fertile Crescent, uh, the king, uh, should be considered um, formidable, and yet God's going to be able to defeat them, even though they can conquer over uh, these six people groups, as well as the five kings of southeastern Canaan. Now, remember last week we talked about the fact that in the second uh, telling, retelling of what happened at the beginning, uh, the author uh, gives us a little sneaky hint as to who wins, because we don't yet know who wins. We will in the next section next week. But we can guess because the second D leaves out something that's in the first D. In the first D, the names of these kings are given. In the second D, the names of the kings are not given putting them in second place, doesn't it? They no longer have a name for themselves, do they? They're not men of name, which means that they're not 
important people anymore. They are the ones who lose. Okay, so we have looked over the, the story again. And now I think we can go on with the next section next week. Oh, yeah, we'll go over it again. Uh, because I really want you to get the story. I think it's a neat story because it's never taught in Sunday school. And I have never heard it mentioned, except for Melchizedek, in church. So this is one of those times where you're learning probably something very new and something, unless you've read through the Bible, uh, you probably never noticed it. And you might never have noticed it even when it was in the Bible because you saw all those names of men or kings and all the names of these cities. And you said, oh, let's hop, skip and jump over this one. <laughs> and now I didn't let you, did I? Because there's so much information here. I hope you had a wonderful time. The Lord bless you. And I'm praying for you. Uh, concerning the, the virus that's coming, uh, we need to be not like the world who's so frightened. We have a God who can defeat anything and anyone. Trust him. Goodbye. <laughs>